I'm no museologist or a curator or a conservator, so it's kind of tricky suggesting that I might be hacking museums. It's a provocative problem. So if I walk into any um, traps, don't let them off too quickly, because I may well be out of my depth. Um, yeah, we, I, I did digital, uh, well, I did fine art, and in many ways, in 92, you had Apple Macs and the BBCBs and post spectrums and things at home. They always seem to be a, a more interesting personal platform or a canvas, for want of a better metaphor, to make art with because they did different things. Um, and I suppose being a boy in the 80s, writing code and copying code from magazines is a very interesting writing process. And I learned to write, I think, through this. So it changed the way I think, I think about things, as well as changed the way I think about networks and how people use networks. Um, I then moved to Edinburgh, uh, where in, in, 19, in 2008, I've got four years now, um, and Edinburgh from the University of Plymouth is a, just a totally different city. You know, one was the Luftwaffe did half the damage, and then the planners did another yeah, proportion of damage to Plymouth, and it's, it's a pretty tricky place to reconstruct, but very, very interesting according to its social network and its history. Um, Edinburgh, of course, was protected, and it protected itself from Abercrombie and defended itself in very different ways, usually with money, um, and it makes a very different city. But what was transparent in that space is that it was full of tourists most of the time, and um, me being an Englishman, if you like, in that context, well, it was absolutely transparent that what I thought was Edinburgh just wasn't consistent. So something that's happened as we've been using more and more digital media is these questions about what might be called consensual. Neuro, uh, William Gibson once wrote Neuromancer, which is this kind of sci-fi projection of cyberspace, we call him cyberspace, and he talked about a consensual hallucination. Now actually, when we go back to these streets, uh, the Oxford Road, I'm not sure what is consensual anymore. I've got a fairly funny feeling that as people listen to their earbuds, half of them are in their own little world, so there's no consensual, unless they're tuning into radio stations, but I'm not, we know what radio stations are. Do you remember those things? They were great, you could tune in. It's like TV stations. So the idea that consensual, or part of the symptoms of a network society, is that very, it's very hard to know what is consensual anymore, which I think has been a very interesting opportunity for people like me to disrupt. And actually what I'm going to show you is a couple of projects, or two or three projects, really deal with practices that want to disrupt any assumption that space may well be consensual. Now, I'm, again, I'm aware that I did this talk kind of a few weeks ago, and there was a, whoa, let, let's hang on to the consensual. We talk about the street, some rules for relating to each other are good because they're consensual, but we don't really touch each other. Have you noticed that? We kind of stay apart. And thousands of people will navigate Manchester on the Saturday shopping, but they don't often touch each other. There are some consensual bylaws which help. But nevertheless, what we think that place is and what we think that space is is deeply contested now. Um, and I guess I want, if I can do anything with the museum question, is what we've learned is that you probably realize the museum is evidently contested. There is no consensual Manchester Museum. Every person who walks in will walk in with different ideas of consumption, perhaps ideas of contribution production that they might want to offer, but others don't. And I've got two wee kids, and it's, oh dear, I want a coffee shop and they want the shop, and then we want the music, the Egyptian stuff, and my daughter wants the animals. It's very complicated. So in many ways, it's, it's what, are, what do we do with these things then? What if we agree that for a while, just for 50 minutes, 45 minutes, that there is no consensual time or space, there's no consensual place. Houses were never consensual. Crikey, I, you know, I worry when my kids will be teenagers. Um, if you think about, for example, time, the first project deals with this critique of mapping as projected through time. And Google gives us a cons an idea of a consensual image because, of course, it gives us Google Maps. Um, but these aren't consensual. In fact, they're, they're, they're hallucinations for sure. The, for example, this might be um, this is the Beijing Olympics. As you probably know, when you kick up Google Earth, you can be as much as two years out of time because the Google imagery can be two years old. Other times, it can be within six months. Very odd. Again, checkerboard of temporal spaces. In the Beijing Olympics, they flew balloons over to capture that and reduce it to a two-week gap. So they managed to manipulate the base plate so it was a sense of close enough to real time as they could possibly get. Who knows what they'll do for London? Are they going to try and do something closer to within a couple of hours or days? So if I see an ice cream van, 
on my iPhone or my iPad or wherever I'm, I'm using, I might think, oh, I can get back to that because that's where the ice cream van is. Because evidently, this isn't real space. This isn't real time. It's just a bunch of JPEGs. But the problem is, and what's fun is, that when the blue dot falls, if we use a device like this, when the blue dot tells you where you are and it throbs in real time, then you get begin to get these interesting glitches. And it's in these odd glitches where you find fast time and slow time and these total time, historical time, getting very complicated. And of course, there's things such as Twitter. If you're on Twitter, it's very hard to know when real time is because if you subscribe to 500 followers, you're getting a lot of updates. If you subscribe to five, you may well be able to follow them in actual time, but that depends when you decide to look at what they're saying. So there's very, very complicated models of time out there. Meanwhile, you've got astronauts tweeting pictures of the planet's surface in real time. So all of these systems, these Cartesian systems, which actually still underpin a lot of digital frameworks, the chronology of time, that there is somehow an edge to time. And if I get a really good atomic clock, I can find out that point, but actually it collapsed. And it's meaningless because it's a social dimension. I've got a few, a few dodgy film clips, and this is, um, this is probably the worst in terms of the movie quality. This is Deja Vu, and what's interesting, this is uh, Denzel Washington being a hero again. What's interesting about Denzel Washington, this, this setup, is a kind of a, for want of a better word, a schizophrenia. He's having to wrestle with multiple time frames. So he's an, a, a policeman who's been recruited by the, uh, the men in black, if you like, the FBI or the CIA. And the CIA have figured out that if they take enough data from all of these little streaming points in these rooms, and they can, re they can reconstruct an idea of a reality, but it takes them 36 hours to do that. So they can take pictures from all the CCTV cameras, all your cameras, and it constructs a reality. And what they're doing now is, in his viewfinder, they're streaming that reality, and he's chasing a killer 36 hours ago. So what's happening, he's looking in the past, so he's through one eye, chasing someone, but he's actually having to navigate actual time, the present, in without the, without the headset. So this is this odd, yeah, this odd schizophrenia where he's, he's beginning to navigate different spaces. And it doesn't really matter where they, when he is, because he knows he's got to solve the crime with the support of the past as well as the present. And I think, and this is, I think, a condition that you and I are having to negotiate as we adopt more and more temporal accounts or temporal systems, uh, sorry, in, in, in digital systems. And when I then reflect back on my experience in Edinburgh, it's, it's precisely the same. I looked at, the College of Art looked out onto the uh, Esplanade of the Castle. And you can, for sure, people, tourists particularly, connecting to a model of Edinburgh absolutely in the past. They're tuning into something, and then they go off and have a, a coffee at the Elephant Cafe, which is where Harry Potter was written. And they tune into these very unusual um, pathways, and they don't all make sense. They don't certainly all make sense in terms of chronology. Many of them are, have got wormholes in them to, to kind of break up some of these. And some of them connect them to Daniel Radcliffe, who isn't really in the past, because he's now playing the guy and the woman in black. Very complicated spaces. So what it makes a city is, is also interesting in terms of framing. What's interesting about Edinburgh, of course, is it tries to sustain a brand. It's a World Heritage Site, and it tries to sustain a, a temporal brand that it is located in the past, unlike Plymouth, or perhaps Manchester, where some of the geographies are more contested. Um, and of course, when you visit all of these cities, I was in Liverpool recently, and I could jump in if I didn't know that city, rather than being a planner or try and move through it and discover, I could just adopt some of those narratives. I could, this, these kind of geographical narratives, I could just go for the Beatles tour, and I could navigate the space, and I guess I'd listen to the, my iPod at the same time, and it wouldn't be, be meaningful because of that. So well, we're very acutely aware that these, if it isn't consensual, what people are doing when they come to your museums or when they come to your cities, they're finding books they're finding narratives with which to then pursue these spaces. And the, the map isn't something that is, isn't as useful as it used to be, because it isn't consensual. As a metaphor, we've been working with, so in some ways this is about the ubiquitous condition, 
it, if we can talk about ubiquity, and if I take IBM's model of ubiquity, which is the idea that you're all connected all the time, everywhere, and I think that ubiquity is the condition to be everywhere and every time. Santa Claus is ubiquitous, for example. If the inference is from the Microsoft and IBM and Hewlett Packard that you are becoming, you have a capacity to be everywhere all the time, so you can get to Facebook everywhere all the time, it doesn't, I don't think it helps us using their model. So what we began to do is start, start looking for other metaphors which explain something that the public can hang on to. For example, Santa Claus. It's easier. My mum knows the possibility. My five-year-old knows what Santa Claus has and can do everywhere on one night. Mary just, she doesn't, that doesn't challenge her. But if you talk to her about, well, that's the same promise that Apple are offering you with the iCloud, it just breaks down because it's just not true. So we're starting to use different metaphors that help people understand what it might be to be ubiquitous. And the ghosts seem very useful because ghosts, of course, are present with us, but are also deeply connected to past and temporal events, and often trauma. Um, and Gay Ava Jordan presents this. I, I read it, shall I not? Um, I'll read from there. The way of the ghosts is haunting, and haunting is a very particular way of knowing what has happened or is happening. Being haunted draws us effectively, sometimes against our will, and always a bit magically into the structure of feeling of a reality we come to experience, not as cold knowledge, but as a transformative recognition. And these actually are quite useful frameworks to reconsider what it is to be digital. Because actually, I think that's how we're beginning to use systems. Um, just to, to hang on to the ghosts and the temporal spatial problem of Edinburgh, is it really doesn't get mashed up enough. But what's happening now in Edinburgh is we've decided to do the Manchester thing, or the Copenhagen thing, and the Amsterdam thing, and get some trams. We all had them hundreds of years ago, hundreds of years ago, but we decided to go back to them and it'll, you know, it'll have to be for our brand. Um, and this is Haymarket, which is the Westerly Station. And that's a, a monument, a war memorial for footballers of the Hearts football team who died in um, both wars. So it's a war memorial. But because of the trams, more recently it's gone. It's been just disappeared. And all of that area now is actually a, a pit in the planet. But again, the ghosts are ubiquitous. They are present throughout time. They're, unless they pass over, you have to consider them not just ubiquitous because they can get to Facebook any point in time, but they are time. They are present. So that monument didn't matter that the material instance of that monument was taken away because the ghosts still exist. So in every November now, for two years running, the ghosts come back and the monument comes back. And it is, it's a quite astonishing social act of something which I think is, again, ubiquitous. It, it, that, that, is, that is the monument. And it doesn't really matter that it has a material kind of architectural form with a clock on it. What matters is that the material, or shall we say the immaterial, idea of the memories and the connections to that landscape are immaterial. And they're actually about people and names and football teams and, and, and war. So it, we became quite interested in how the, these glitches are very, but we do, these, are, these aren't problematic. It makes utter sense for that to come back. And, and they, let's just like ghosts, they will begin to haunt those spaces. If you look into ghost movies, and I kind of like a good ghost story, Children are, are critical for many of them, actually. Um, and I think this is because of their temporal innocence. That they ha they, what, they ha what happens with children in many, many movies is that they, they're used because they don't have our time. They don't work. They don't go to jobs. They don't have to worry about, well, they do worry about the nine o'clock bell. But when they're at playtime, the bell just goes and they jump back into class. So Swift, I think, would talk about them being temporally innocent. My five-year-old doesn't, I could say that Christmas is in two weeks, and I've got a good idea that she'd believe me. If I did the right things, I could construct Christmas for her in a couple of weeks. Um, my son's eight, he doesn't, I think he's pretty sure now, he knows the days of the week. He knows there's five days of school, two days of the weekend. He's, pretty, he's got the seasons, he knows when summer is. And Children are used explicitly within that age, probably before they reach seven or before they get learnt how to tell the time at school, because they have no, they have a very fluid model of time. And it's in that innocence, people like Cole from Sixth Sense, 
become these gateways to the heart. And I won't give away that what Cole can do, if you haven't watched the movie, it's a spoiler, but it's about the ability to transcend some of these modern models of space, which say, that tell us when real time is and when things are inappropriate to talk about. 